Romans chapter number 13, generally designated as the resurrection chapter of the Bible. I'd like to read beginning in verse number 12 down through verse number 22. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 15 beginning in verse number 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain? Yea, and if we have found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept? For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. We have here a problem apparently which developed in Corinth surrounding the literal bodily resurrection from the dead. It is important for us to understand, I feel, that the Bible teaches that there is going to be a complete resurrection. By complete, I mean both the lost and the saved, the Bible teaches, are going to be resurrected from the dead. For instance, if you turn to John chapter number 5, and verse number 24 is where I will begin my reading, down when we get to verse 29, 28 and 29, we will see this truth about the total resurrection. But I'm beginning back in verse number 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Jesus said, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That there is a total resurrection is also seen in Acts chapter 24, most specifically in verse number 15, after Paul had been arrested, before Felix, he spoke of the resurrection of the just and the unjust. However, in 1 Corinthians 15, we are primarily talking of the resurrection of the just. I bring those verses out to show that you have a choice of being resurrected with the just or resurrected with the unjust. They that have done good. And the one good thing you can do to assure yourself the resurrection with the just 
is to receive the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary for the atonement of your sin. According to the Bible, nothing else will do but the accepting of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now that being the case then, in the church at Corinth, there seems to have been a problem of some folks denying the resurrection, the literal bodily resurrection. It is interesting for us to note that we are not astonished when the lost world, the agnostics, the atheists, others in that category, I say they do not astonish us when they deny the resurrection. After all, they're unbelievers. They're outside the household of faith and we should expect nothing else from them. It does astonish though, it is astounding when those who are supposedly within the household of Christianity start questioning and denying the resurrection. That has been and is being done even today. I say when men of the cloth or ministers in the pulpit start questioning the literal bodily resurrection, it astounds me because the Bible teaches it. Whether you like it or not, if you claim to be a Christian, you're going to have to have the Bible in there somewhere because it is the holy book of Christianity. When professors in so-called Christian Bible schools or seminaries or whatever start questioning the literal bodily resurrection of not only the Lord Jesus Christ but of the saved, it is astounding unto me. They just as well deny the faith, get outside the church and claim to be an atheist themselves. They cannot have any solid authority whatsoever because they are in so many words stating that the Bible is not trustworthy because the Bible teaches there is a resurrection and most specifically and gloriously of those who know Jesus Christ as their Savior. The disciples were intent upon that very truth. One of the things most surely believed among them one of the things that they surely went everywhere preaching the word as per Acts 8, 4 is that the, of the gospel. The gospel is found perhaps as it were in a nutshell in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 3 and 4. If you're in that chapter still look at verses 3 and 4 with me. The apostle Paul said, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And so I say, we have here at least admit with me, biblically speaking, biblically perspective, we have the teaching undoubtedly of the resurrection, bodily, literal resurrection of Jesus Christ our Savior. It is interesting for me to note that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the core message of Christianity. When I say the gospel, I think we need to include all that the gospel really involves and undertakes when we use that phraseology. You see, to me anyway, to get the real picture of the gospel, you've got to get the picture of a holy, righteous God who is of purer eyes than to even behold evil. Look on sin. You must get the picture of that God loving the sinner and sending his son as the babe at Bethlehem's manger, Jesus Christ, who lived an absolutely perfect life. Which of you convinceth me of sin, said he? I find no fault in him, said Pilate. 
We can find nothing to miss in him. And they hired, bribed false witnesses against him. I say his sinless life has got to be inevitably and ultimately part of the gospel. Yes. And then it is that we must understand that he went to the cross of his own will, yes. taking our sin upon himself and dying there. He didn't have to do that. No man taketh my life from it. I lay it down of myself and I take it up, he said. We must understand that there is a holy, righteous God that his son, Jesus Christ, came into the world and lived a holy, righteous, sinless life. And that that Son of God took our sin upon him at Calvary and died on the cross having shed his blood for our sin. But that's not the end of the story. He was buried and the third day, according to the scriptures, he rose again from the dead. I say then that we have more. He right now is at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. And I say there's more than that. The Bible teaches he is coming again to receive us unto himself that where he is, there we may be also. That is the cornerstone of Christian doctrine. It is the rock of Gibraltar of the Christian faith. The literal bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is the hinge upon which the door of Christianity swings. I am amazed, somewhat amused, that when it comes to the historicity of Jesus Christ, I know of no one who denies it. The atheist, the agnostic, the false religionist, the no matter what it is, historically we have one Jesus of Nazareth. Not only is he mentioned in the scriptures, but in secular history as well. We have that one whom when Philip went to find Nathaniel, said, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. I find no one who denies the historicity of Jesus Christ. When it comes to his living there yonder in the Holy Land in a relatively very small circumference, I find no one who denies that. When it comes to his dying on the cross, I find no one who denies that. When it comes to there being a pilot, I find no one who denies that. When there comes to being a Herod who desired to see some miracle performed by him, I find no one who denies it. When it comes to his dying and being put into the tomb, I find no one who denies that. But where the riff comes in is in that business of the resurrection. It's that empty tomb on that third day that causes all the controversy, but it also makes all the distinctive difference. Yes, it does. Amen. We have here... What I might say is a truth that separates the men from the boys. And it is coming down to what it really does is separate the saved from the lost after it's all said and done. And I find myself, as I have said so many times before, that a lot... Christianity in particular, but that's not the only thing, if I may so say, however time forbids our getting into secular reasoning. Christianity in specific rises or falls with whether or not Jesus literally rose from the dead that third day. Now try to think with me just for a moment or two of if he did rise from the dead, that's one thing. 
astounding thing. If he did not rise from the dead, that's another thing. And that is kind of what Paul is getting at here when he says, How say some of you that there is no resurrection from the dead? For if there be no resurrection from the dead, then is Christ not risen? And at this point, I could talk a lot about the uselessness of preaching if Christ be not risen from the dead. We're all kind of foolish for being here today. Oh, I know there could be some good philosophy perhaps put forth and there could be some Dr. Feel Good medicine put forth and there could be some pump up motivation put forth and hopefully send the people away happier than when they came in and all of that kind of stuff. But the distinctiveness is in whether or not he rose from the dead literally. I could talk about how foolish pre preaching is. I could also say that your faith is foolishness. It is a mirage, as it were. It is mere delusion, so to speak. Folks, faith is great. But it's got to be founded on some facts. Literal, empirical evidence, as it were. The Apostle Paul is saying if the fact of the resurrection of the Lord is not true, your faith is in vain. You can forget it. And he also goes on further to say, if you noted as I read a moment ago in verse number 8, 18, pardon me, that the believers who've already died are just that, dead. Perished is the word Paul uses in verse number 18. I could talk a lot about that, but there's some other things I want to talk about. I could also talk about the fact from verse number 19 that if Christ be not risen from the dead, our comfort is gone, our joy is gone, our hope is gone, our rest is gone. The way the Apostle Paul puts it is we are of all men most miserable. That sounds like the joy's gone to me. That sounds like the comfort's gone to me. That sounds like we have little to live for to me. If Christ be not risen from the dead, our comfort is gone. I could talk about that stuff, but instead I'd rather speak specifically in four different realms. First of all, if Christ had not literally risen from the dead, the disciples were a bunch of liars. Number two, if Christ did not literally rise from the dead, and I, I want to be very careful when I say this, and I hope you'll take this in the right way, but Jesus Christ didn't know what he was talking about. Number three, if Jesus Christ had not literally risen from the dead, we have no hope of being resurrected and being with him one of these days. And number four, if Jesus did not literally rise from the dead, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. I hope to have time to get to that particular thing in a little bit more detail. I want to go back first of all. The disciples would have been a group of liars, con artists, pyramid schemers, the very first Ponzi floaters. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, they were not telling the truth. For instance, in 1 Corinthians 15, after speaking in verses 3 and 4 of the Gospel, 
In verse number 5, the Apostle Paul went on to say, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me. One thing the disciples insisted on as they were scattered abroad, they went everywhere preaching the gospel. I say one thing they insisted upon was the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. They had companied with him in life. They were near him in death, although I grant they all forsook him and fled, they still are spotted around the scenario of the cross. They were discouraged in his burial. But when he came out of that tomb alive, it can be kind of said uh, in a symbolic way, they resurrected with him. Their hopes came back to life. We went to the tomb this morning and wondered who was going to roll away the stone. And when we got there, the stone was already rolled back and we saw him and, and he's gone. They moved his body. Something's gone wrong. So, something's gone wrong. Not only did the disciples and the women have that to say, but those big burly Roman soldiers had that to say too. They went under the authorities and said, man, something's gone wrong with your plan. He came out of that grave. You're going to have to think up something fast. Well, here's a bunch of money. We'll bribe you. That's what was going on in Matthew chapter number 28. Say ye that his disciples came while we slept and stole the body away. Now, I've said this so many times, uh, you could say it with me probably. How do they know that it was his disciples if they were asleep? And another thing, why were they asleep? That was a capital offense in the Roman guard. You know, folks, the Bible never asked me to believe anything as absurd as the atheists and agnostic and unbelievers asked me to believe. The disciples were intent on his resurrection. That was their core message, man. He is alive. We sang in Sunday school this morning, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. He is alive. Can you see the difference? They watched him die, and they went back to their various places, and uh, then word came, hey, listen, his body isn't in the tomb. And, and boy, they headed down there. Peter and Johnny ran down there, and they were wondering about this. The angel spoke to them, and then they saw him for themselves. Thomas was brought out in Sunday school was at church that very first Easter Sunday. I don't know whether he went fishing or what he did, but he wasn't at church. And he said, I will not believe unless I'm able to put my finger and my hand into the nail prints and into the scar riven side. I won't believe. The next Sunday Thomas went to church and Jesus met him on his level. I bet old Thomas felt a little bit on the sheepy's side when Jesus said, Thomas. <laughs> Thomas thought to himself, here it comes. He said, Thomas, reach hither thy hand. Thomas fell down before him. He didn't need to reach hither his hand. He said, my Lord and my God. Those disciples were intent on it. Listen, these fellows were not a bunch of psychos. They were not a bunch of fellows protesting social injustice. They were not a bunch of fellows who were willing to die because the government was so rotten and so corrupt and so crooked that life was unbearable for them. These fellows had a message of hope and they were telling people everywhere, your sins can be forgiven, you can get saved because Jesus died but he rose again the third day. Amen.
you have to understand this question, please, if I may. What they have to gain by co concocting up some type of false conspiracy? What did preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ get them? If I could borrow from Spurgeon at this time, I will. They were sawn asunder. They were stoned. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, in caves. They were brought before the Roman government. Peter was crucified upside down, having, as the tradition goes, Dean said he didn't feel worthy to die in the same way his Lord died. Yes, it's that Peter who denied the Lord at the first but repented and got right. His brother Andrew is said to have likewise been crucified upside down. Others of them were stoned. Remember Stephen yonder in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts? He was stoned. Thomas, it is said, was martyred in India. They went everywhere preaching the gospel. And the weapons of their warfare were not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. It's like Paul said, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and your breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. These disciples weren't bomb strapper honors going out to protest and take a bunch of other people out with them. These fellows were not just a, a conspiratorial type of men all from the same walk of life who wanted to get something going, who had a cause they wanted to make a name for themselves over, who were trying to get their stock to go up on the stock market. What did you get them? Well, I know what you're thinking. It got, them, got most of them dead. John was the one who lived a natural life and, and died a natural death on the Isle of Patmos. He was banned to the mine Isle of the Isle of Patmos. What did get him? What reason would they have had to go out with that message? No reason whatsoever. Listen, folks, that empty tomb business, that literal bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ business, was not a hoax dreamed up by a bunch of wackos. You've got men in their right minds. If I could borrow a little bit of thinking of Peter a little bit, say, I guess I ought to know what I'm talking about. I saw him. Of course, Peter's the one that went on and said in the first chapter of his second book, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Yes. And so I think to myself that had Christ not risen from the dead, the, the disciples would have all been a bunch of liars. How they could have pulled it off, I cannot believe. And when it came down to being martyred in the tortuous way they were, I cannot believe they would have held out. They were given the chance to recant, but they wouldn't do it. Why? I have to believe it was because they knew Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. Number two, if Jesus had not risen from the dead, it would have meant that you could not trust the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I say that, and I say it reverently because you guys know that I believe the Bible. But the Lord had said that he was going to die on the cross and the third day he would rise again. I'd like to read these following scriptures and I know it's getting late so I'll try to be brief here. In Matthew 28, 6, we read it responsibly just a moment ago. You guys read the even-numbered verse number 6 of Matthew 28, where the angel said, He is not here, for he is risen as he said. 
Mark 16, 7. Go your way, tell his disciples, Peter, that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said. Matthew 12, 20. Jesus is talking. He says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 16, 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and be killed and be raised again the third day. Do you realize, folks, Jesus staked his ministry upon this prophecy? that the third day he was going to rise from the dead. Now then, if he did not rise from the dead, that would mean that he did not know what he was talking about. He might have even needed a good neurologist himself, I cannot say. Of course, you know I believe he did know what he was talking about, and you know that I believe he literally did rise again the third day from the grave. I believe that it's important for us to understand and realize that if the Lord Jesus did not tell us the truth when he said he was going to rise again, then you can forget all the prophecies in the scripture having any truth to them. You can forget all the promises in the Bible having any truth to them. You can forget all the hopes it generates, all the comforts it affords. You can forget all the good that it may go in our lives, you can just take this. It is empty, feel-good psychology at best. And number three, if Christ be not risen from the dead, then we have a problem. Because what that means is we're not going to rise. I mean, what is it? it nothing more than an empty hope. I can't help but be reminded that in Acts chapter number 17 and verse number 31, the Bible gives an interesting phrase in the last part of that verse. There the Bible says, Wherefore God hath given assurance unto all in that he hath raised him from the dead. What is my assurance of my own resurrection? What is my assurance that the Father hath accepted the expiatory sacrifice of Jesus Christ for my sin? What is it that gives me that hope that it's an acceptable sacrifice? It is that Jesus rose again the third day from the grave. And that is the guarantee that I will rise again. Folks, we have no guarantee without a little literal resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In fact, John 14, 19, this verse is a classic. Jesus said, Because I live, ye shall live also. And I know what somebody's going to say. Well, now, Brother Burkholder, you know that's before he ever went to the cross and the resurrection. Of course it is, but it's true, isn't it? Because I live, ye shall live also. I should like to say that if Jesus Christ is still in the tomb, we just as well be in the tomb with him. Our hopes are vain. And that leads me to the fourth point here. Ye are yet in your sins. Do you remember my reading that a moment ago from 1 Corinthians chapter number 15? Your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Folks, it's not our moral condition that I'm trusting in to get to heaven. But it's what Christ did at Calvary and rose again the third day. As much as I am for sincerity, it's not sincerity upon which I'm resting my hope. In my case, I wouldn't have much to rest on. But I can assure you, I am not using that as my basis of hope. Nor is it my good works or your good works. Yes, I believe that we should do the best we can. I believe that being one with Christ, we ought to be just that, one with Christ. But I'm going to say this, I'm basing my hope upon the fact that Jesus died on the cross for my sin and upon the fact that he rose again the third day literally for my justification. 
The Bible tells us we're not complete in ourselves, but we are complete in Him. Right? Colossians 2.10 Ye are complete in Him. You're not complete in your good works. You're not complete in your sincerity. You're not complete in the amount of money you might be able to give to the church or to do good things for the community or any of that. I am for living a good life. I am for living according to the principles of the Bible. But I tell you, the hope that I have of going to heaven is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ my Lord. If he be not risen from the dead, ye are yet in your sins, and I am still in my sins. I understand the importance of that. The wages of sin is death. And that's the sum total of death. The first death and the second death, which is eternal fire in hell. I mean, hey, if he be not risen from the dead, ye are yet responsible for your own sins. Now if Jesus be risen from the dead though, the converse is likewise correct. You can take your sins to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and have forgiveness of sin and be given the imputed righteousness of our Lord and Savior. But if Christ be not risen from the dead, you have no hope whatsoever. We just as well be like any other religious organization on earth. The one distinguishing factor about the business of Christianity is that we've got a Savior. A Savior who realized we couldn't save ourselves, so He went to the cross and died on the cross for us. If He did not rise again from the dead, ye are yet in your sins. Now there's an interesting verse in John chapter number 8 and verse 24 where Jesus said, If ye believe not that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. Ah, kind of an interesting twist as I close. If Christ be not risen from the dead, ye are yet in your sins. But Jesus said, If ye believe not that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. In your sins. In your sins. But the truth can't help but come to my mind. It's all available because Jesus Christ did die and He was buried and He did rise again the third day. But there's one more thing. If ye believe not that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. But if you'll put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if you'll take the Lord into your heart as your Savior, if you'll lay your sins down at the feet of the cross, if you'll realize and understand that the gospel is the good news that you can be saved and you want to be saved and you take that step of faith and receive Christ into your heart, you don't have to die in your sins. Therefore, if any man be... In Christ, he's a new creature. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ? That's the thing that makes the difference. If not, you can get saved today. I'll give an invitation. I'll invite you to do one of two things if you want to be saved. Meet me down here at the front or take a position over at the door to my right. A counselor will come and show you in the inquiry room how to be saved right out of the Bible. Don't take man's word for it. See it for yourself. Take God's word for it. You can be saved today. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. May we stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Heavenly Father, I thank You for Thy love, Thy goodness, Thy mercy. I thank You for Thy word. I thank You for dying on the cross for our sins. I thank You, Lord God, that You not only died, but that Thou wast buried and You rose again the third day for our justification. 
And I pray, Lord God, that that truth may now be brought home by Thy Holy Spirit to the congregation. I'm asking, Lord, that if there be anyone here today who doth not genuinely know Thee as their Savior, that this day might be the day of their salvation. And those who are here and are saved, Lord, but perhaps while in Thee, they have not been living like it, I'm asking that this might be a day when Thy Holy Spirit should bring conviction to grant us all to understand the wonderful need to walk with Thee and talk with Thee and to try to be with the program that Thou wouldst have us to be with in life here. I pray, O oh God, that You'll see that salvation is not the end but the beginning of a wonderful walk with Thee. I pray, Lord, whatever the need might be of any person in the room this morning, that You'd show them You can meet that need according to Thy riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto Thee I commit the invitation, I commit the congregation. I pray Thee to have Thy specific will and way. In Jesus' name, Amen. Number 154 in the book, if you'd like to sing along on the invitation.